Did Los Angeles Rams safety Taylor Rapp just play the best game so far of his three-year career? Find out on this episode of the Locked on Rams podcast and more. You are Locked on Rams, your daily Los Angeles Rams podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Rams Nation, how's it going? As always, it is your boy, your host, Sosa Cremendez. I'm a fantasy analyst at PFF and your host here at the Locked On Rams podcast, your number one daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Rams and part of the Locked On Podcast Network. This episode of the Locked On Rams pod is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. And we can now dive into some of the topics for this episode. We've got a bit of an injury update for players like Johnny Munt as well as Jake Funk. Unfortunately, not good news for either of those players. They will both be done for the season. And then we're going to dive into some of these other topics. we got the PFF numbers, the in-depth statistics to dive into who stood out in this game and maybe who didn't play so well, obviously, from the game between the Rams and the Giants in week six on Sunday. So first, we'll dive into this injury news and really what the Rams may have to do now when it comes to their roster. First being the most important loss. Tight end Johnny Munt, as we talked about on yesterday's episode, if you listened, uh, head coach Sean McVay said that he suffered a knee injury and it was probably going to be a bad one. And today it was confirmed by Sean McVay that Munt did in fact tear his ACL. He's going to be out for the season now. And uh, this is bad news for the Rams, of course, but we'll dive into why in just a second here. Running back Jake Funk, who is the team's third running back, the starting kick returner, he also actually tore his hamstring which we didn't really know what the severity of his injury was, but it sounds like he's also going to go ahead with surgery. And uh, if that's the case, then he's also going to be done for the year. So the Rams are now in a bit of a transitional period where, you know, they're starting to lose a few bodies. You look at Darius Williams was placed on short-term IR the other week. Uh, he's still going to be out for the next two games. And now you start to lose some of these other role style players, not really your starters or anyone that's super important in terms of the elite category players. But Johnny Munt was an important player for this offense because a lot of times the Rams trotted two tight ends out there in their 12 personnel packages, which means one running back, two tight ends. And typically they love to run in these types of formations. They were very productive. And not only that, but Johnny Munt's always been a very solid blocker. When I go back and watch the tape, and I have done that pretty much every single week this season, you see a lot of these 8, 10, 12-yard rushing plays come on the back of a guy like Tyler Higby and someone else like Munt, where they do just such a really good job of sealing off their blocks on the ends of the tackles. And now, of course, the Rams are not going to have that guy. So that hurts. Of course, Munt was never really a huge component of the passing game. I don't think they're going to really suffer anything there. The Rams have so many weapons that just doesn't really matter to them. If they lose anybody, they have so many guys that they can find replacement level players. But they will definitely feel this loss, I think, when it comes to their rushing attack and some of the blocking there, because now when you look after Munt on the rest of the roster, all you really have is Jacob Harris and Bryson Hopkins, two guys that we both know are not priority blockers. They're both guys that are essentially like big slot type receivers, especially Jacob Harris. And, you know, that's kind of where they moonlight as they're going to be receiving weapons maybe someday in the NFL. But neither guy is going to really stick their hand in the dirt and be a great blocker. That's just not their forte. And so now the Rams kind of have this question of, are they going to trot out one of these guys instead of signing somebody and just kind of hope that they can at least get by in terms of their blocking or maybe develop throughout the rest of the season and become better blockers? Or are they going to try to bring someone up from the practice squad, maybe a Kendall Blanton who might be a little bit more fit for that role? Or look to go sign somebody from the free agent market who is known to be a primary blocking tight end that's not really going to bring anything to the table as you know somebody who's going to be a receiver. And not only that, but Johnny Munt also played a lot of special team snaps for the Rams. So now they have to find somebody to fill that role. And I don't think it's the hardest role to fill, of course. I mean, there's teams that are losing star players left and right. You look at the Rams losing a guy like Darius Williams. It's going to be a lot harder to replace a cornerback too and a legitimate player at that caliber of talent as opposed to a backup tight end. So these are sort of, as Sean McVay would call them, champagne problems. It's not the exact type of kill shot that would ruin a season. But, you know, these are the little injuries that sort of mount over the 
a cruel of an entire season. And it obviously hurts a team, especially like the Rams, who like to rely on a lot of these role style players. So it's unfortunate for Johnny Munt. You know, this is going to be a big setback for him. And it sucks because he finally got elevated to that tight end two spot after last year playing that tight end three role behind Gerald Everett as well. So unfortunate for him, but hopefully he'll be back and healthy at some point next year. And the Rams now have to find somebody obviously at that spot. And then you move to the Jake Funk injury. I don't think this one's going to really affect the Rams too much. I mean, you look at the kick returner role. I think they could find somebody to fill that role. Maybe Tutu Atwell might be a good option there. Maybe even a Deshaun Jackson, but I don't think the Rams want to succumb him and put him out there to really just accumulate all these hits and physicality. So probably not the best option, but Tutu Atwell, I think should be fine in that role. And I'm sure there's probably some other guys, maybe a Sony Michelle, maybe someone like that, who also, by the way, had a shoulder injury from this game, I think. But according to Sean McVay, He's going to be fine. He's going to be good to play on Sunday. And John Wolford, backup quarterback, also hurt his neck. And that's obviously a bit of a scary situation because, as we know, last year he got hurt in the playoff game and it was a head slash neck injury as well. So probably not the best thing to hear, but it sounds like he's also going to be good to go for Sunday as well. So that's good news for the Rams. They should be okay as best as possible going into this next week and throughout the rest of the season. As of right now, they still have one bye week coming up in I want to say maybe about a month I forget exactly when it is so that's going to be good for them to kind of just sit back and try to get healthy but it's still only one week and a lot of these players are starting to accrue a lot of these injuries which is obviously always going to hurt especially when you're a roster that's as top heavy as the Rams a lot of their talent is really reliant on a handful of players so this is unfortunate news for a couple of these guys but the Rams should be okay hopefully Funk and Munt are okay coming back next season they're still going to have roles then so we'll see exactly how their rehab starts to go over the next long term. But for the Rams, they should be okay. I think we're going to start to see some of these maybe practice squad additions come up. We'll start to keep our eyes on what happens here. Of course, the Rams have a lot of flexibility in terms of guys on the practice squad, as well as people available on the open market and free agency. So we'll see how the Rams decide to fill these holes. In just a second here, we're going to dive into some of these performances from this week six game between the Rams and the Giants. You guys can always follow us on Twitter at QB's MEP and at Locked On Rams and on YouTube at Locked On Rams. And I want to tell you about one of our sponsors for today's episode. This episode of the Locked On Rams podcast is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965, much longer than I've been alive. That's pretty crazy to think. Win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, the home or away team can come to recharge. So head to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. Did somebody say Locked On Rams watch party? That'd be pretty crazy as a person who's frequented a lot of alcoholic beverages in my time. McDonald's, the absolute go-to when it comes to uh, trying to sober up a little bit at the end of the night or even the hangover the next day. There's no cure like McDonald's. I'm speaking from a place of experience, unfortunately for me. You guys should absolutely go check out McDonald's. I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, you probably had it at some point in your life. A lot of our childhood memories from McDonald's, so it's always great to go back and just enjoy a nice meal. I'm loving it, and you guys probably are too. Now we can dive into this second segment here and start to look at how some of these performances came out for the Rams in terms of their contest between the Giants and the Rams. And of course, we're going to start on the offensive side of the ball. I think the one area here that I have circled is this offensive line. And we've talked about it even in yesterday's episode where, you know, this offensive line is playing great. And I think we all kind of know that. But at the same time, they still don't feel like they're really getting their due, right? I always think about this quote where, you want to give people their flowers while they can smell them. And it's kind of morbid, but you know, it still kind of reminds me like we don't know that the offensive line is playing great until we go back and rewatch it because nobody's watching a center. Your eyes are typically following the football. So you're watching the quarterback, the running backs, the receivers, the guys that always have, you know, the big plays, the ones that are throwing the touchdowns, catching the touchdowns. But when you look at their performance, left tackle, Andrew Whitworth, right tackle, Rob Havenstein, both guys completely blanked in this game. And what I mean by that, neither guy allowed a single pressure in this contest. I mean, it's just absurd how consistently great these guys are. You don't hear their names brought up in a game because they're just not getting beat. And then you look at the PFF numbers and everything checks out. They're not getting beat. I mean, these guys are so good at what they do and everything that the Rams do on offense starts up front. Like Matthew Stafford has a long average depth of target or a high yards per attempt figure, or can throw the football down the field because they're giving him time and the running game, the same thing. The reason why Daryl Henderson's ripping off 75, 80 yards rushing every single game or why Sony Michelle looks like a talented back who's averaging four, four and a half, five yards per carry in these games 
always begins up front, man. You got to give these guys some love. They're so good this season. I can't even believe how good they are, especially with how much we question them going into this season. Absolutely hats off. They were dominant once again. And then, of course, Cooper Cup, the one guy we all knew stood out in this game. It doesn't take a genius or Nick Saban to watch this game to be able to tell you that this guy stood out. I mean, he had like nine catches for 130 yards and two touchdowns, but there was a really cool statistic shared uh, by JB Long. I believe it was on Twitter, and uh, he said that Cooper Cup is only the second receiver in NFL history to have, I think it was 600 plus yards and seven plus touchdowns. I think it was through the first six weeks of the season. The only other receiver to ever do it, Randy Moss. And of course, anytime you're being not necessarily compared, but anytime you're achieving things and being put into the same sentence as what a lot of people thought was the greatest receiver ever, you're doing something not only right, but you're just absolutely dominating out of your mind. And I think doesn't take a genius to tell you that. Yeah, Cooper Cup is freaking good at football. I mean, the guy is having a year that we haven't seen from a Rams receiver in a long time. I mean, sure, he's on pace to put up 1,700 or 1,800 yards and you know X amount of touchdowns. But I think by the time this season's over, we might be looking at a guy that leads the NFL in receiving yardage, maybe he's setting certain Rams records. And I'm thinking back to I want to say maybe three, four weeks ago, somebody asked me on one of the mailbag episodes, do you think Cooper Cup can set any records? And I think I said only receptions was probably the best guess or my best bet that he could set. And now I'm starting to think about it again. Like this dude might actually set some records for this franchise in terms of single season statistics, whether that's receptions, receiving touchdowns, receiving yards. He's been crazy productive. I mean, he is so, so good. That is clear as day but it's awesome to see that he's keeping pace with a guy like randy moss that tells you everything you need to know about how he's playing this season the dude is absolutely unreal and is consistently open i mean he and stafford look great together their chemistry is only going to get stronger i think throughout the rest of the season so we'll see how that shakes out in four six eight weeks time now flipping the page to look at the defense because we've talked about the offense enough the defense is always what stands out when i get to dive into some of these statistics now i want to start up front the defensive line the guys who pressure the quarterbacks terrell lewis aaron donald leonard floyd all tied for first with four pressures in this contest and obo okoronko right behind those guys with three pressures in this game and uh it might seem like obo was maybe a step behind because the pressures aren't aligned with the rest of the guys but in terms of win percentage, pressure percentage, pass rush productivity, all these stats from PFF, it was Obo Okoronko who had the best day amongst any of these pass rushers for the Rams because, yeah, he had a few less pass rushing snaps, which is why he had maybe less pressures or less sacks or whatever the case is. But in terms of an efficiency basis, how effective he was with his snaps, the dude was amazing. And not only him, I mean, Leonard Floyd was unstoppable in this game. Aaron Donald, unblockable as usual. Terrell Lewis, a very good contest as well. I mean, these guys continue to step up. We talked about this unit going into this season as, you know, is anybody going to step up across Leonard Floyd? We knew what Leonard Floyd was coming into this year. Of course, we knew what Aaron Donald was. But outside of that, there was a lot of question marks. There was injury question marks with Oboe and Terrell Lewis. There was other question marks about other guys. Justin Hollins, is he going to develop? Is Chris Garrett going to bring anything to the table? And right now, I mean, this defensive line is playing out of their mind. I have to still go back and check. But prior to this week being played, the Rams were second in total pressures amongst all defenses. They were only second to the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys, I think I had 110 pressures on the season. The Rams, 108. So they were basically neck and neck to be tied for first in pressures. And pressures are a much more indicative stat of how well a defensive line is playing or rushing the passer as opposed to sacks, which is you know, the number that everyone wants to look at. How many times did they sack this guy? Well, pressures can amount to much better than a sack, right? If you pressure a quarterback and he throws an air and pass and he gets picked off or picked sixth, that's a lot better than a sack, isn't it? So sacks, they don't tell the whole story. They're great. We all want sacks, of course. Uh, but at the end of the day, pressures are very important too. And right now, this defensive line is playing out of their minds when it comes to pressuring quarterbacks. In just a second here, we're going to dive into some of these coverage numbers and see how well these guys played, as well as Taylor Rapp and decide if he had his best game in his short career so far in the NFL. And of course, make sure to tune back in throughout the rest of this week. We're going to flip the page and dive into the Los Angeles Rams and Detroit Lions matchup coming up here in week seven. But before we get there, I wanted to tell you guys about one more of our sponsors today. 
in life, we're all bound for different things. With beachbound.com vacations, you can be bound for adventure, bound for passion, bound for discovery, or bound for togetherness, bound for immersion, or bound for rejuvenation, or you may be bound for encountering the unexpected. Personally, when I'm at a beach resort, you guys know how I like to do it. I talked about it in the first segment with McDonald's. My feet are kicked up, drink in hand, cigar in the other, enjoying life, smiling, and trying to soak up as much sun as possible, especially here with Canada. I mean, it is getting cold out here. With beachbound.com, you can find your perfect beach vacation for you, no matter what you're looking for. What are you bound for? Visit beachbound.com today to find out. And then, of course, our last sponsor here, Rock Auto. You guys have heard me talk about them many times on this podcast. I'm sure if you own a car or if you drive, you probably went through the process of calling up your mechanic, trying to get some sort of part for your car or your vehicle that's just not working, having to wait seven to 10 business days, having to pay outrageous prices. You don't have to deal with any of that stuff anymore. Rock Auto is a family-owned business that's been serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. No matter whether you're a person who likes to fix things yourself or you're professional and you're looking for reliably low prices, you should go check out Rock Auto. All you have to do, just go to their website and check out all their available parts. They have basically every make and model that you can imagine. So no matter whether your car is old or new, they should have you covered. Amazing selections, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and write locked on in their how did you hear about us section so they know that we sent you. And of course, as always, thank you guys so much for always making us your first daily listen here at the Locked On Rams podcast. For your second daily listen, go check out the Peacock and Williamson NFL podcast. These guys are going to break down every major NFL news story every single day in under 30 minutes, wherever you get your podcast entirely free. And now we can dive into this final segment here. We teased it, talking about some of these coverage numbers and there are two players that I definitely want to highlight here as standout performers and maybe one that didn't play so great, but we'll dive into it here in a second. I want to start with the positives first. Talk about Dante Dion. I mean, this was a guy that I genuinely thought throughout the offseason might start at nickel for the Rams. I talked about it many times. I'm sure a lot of you guys might remember. Uh, I talked about whether he, David Long, one of these guys is probably going to win that nickel job. And I said, don't count out Dante Dion. Like this guy can gain. He is a baller. He can play, and you talk about it in this game. Five days ago, he was on the practice squad. The Rams call him up from the practice squad. He's immediately a starter for them, and he balled in this game. He was targeted 12 times, only gave up six receptions, 37 total yards on six receptions on 12 targets, a passer rating of 56.6. That is not much at all, and only 0.71 yards per coverage snap allowed. Those are great numbers. I mean, that is fantastic from a guy that was on the practice squad. Like we talked about, this guy should have made the 53 man roster. I couldn't believe that he didn't make the roster. And of course, I understand, you know, it's a numbers game. At the end of the day, they kept maybe a different position, maybe five safeties or six safeties or whatever the case is, as opposed to keeping that fifth cornerback. But Dante Dion, in my opinion, is better than David Long is. He's probably better than Robert Rochelle is. I think he's the third best corner on this team. And, you know, if he continues to mount performances like this in place of Darius Williams while Williams is hurt, it might be time to have that discussion in two or three weeks time. Who is the third best corner on this team and who gives the team, you know, the best possibility when it comes to mixing and matching those corners? Is it going to be Rochelle? Is it going to be long? Is it going to be Dion? Because we know Darius Williams and Jalen Ramsey are your guys there. But somebody has to play that third spot, and it might just be Dante Dion if he can continue to mount performances like this. Shout out to him. He was amazing in this game. There's really nothing more you could ask of him. Targeted a bunch of times. I'm going to assume that Daniel Jones probably knew this guy was on the practice squad just a few days earlier and thought, you know, I might be able to pick on this guy, so I'm going to try to take advantage. And clearly that didn't work well. I mean, he was targeted 12 times. That is so much. That is more than a lot of cornerbacks have in two, three, four weeks even. So that tells you how well he played. I mean, it wasn't like he was just running around out there and wasn't targeted. I mean, he was making play after play. So huge shout out to him for stepping up. He was not the only guy in the secondary, though, that balled. Taylor Rapp, man, this guy might have had the best game in his NFL career so far. I think it was probably because he was targeted four times in this game, gave up zero catches, zero yards, zero across the board, except for interceptions. He had two of those and 31 interception yards. I mean, Talk about a performance. This guy was sort of on the hot seat from Rams fans and Rams media, even myself, you know, talking about he's just not playing that great. We expect more out of him. This guy's super talented. 
And uh, yeah, talk about stepping up in a big way. This guy was fantastic for the Rams in this game. He was the best defender on the field. No doubt about that, in my opinion. He seemed to have something on Daniel Jones. I don't know what it was. Maybe some sort of film study. He saw something that he felt comfortable with because he was doing a good job of reading Daniel Jones's eyes, knew exactly where he wanted to go with the football. And he was doing a good job of disguising his drops. And of course, you know, that's how you get two interceptions in a game, but he was just great in this game. I think, you know, we can't really expect two interceptions or these kind of insane performances every single week, but if he can start to sort of build that confidence, get that footing back underneath him, start to build on this kind of a performance moving forward. Of course, the secondary is going to be a lot better off for it. So we'll see, you know, if this was sort of just a one-off performance, or if this is something that, you know, maybe Taylor Rapp just needed that breakout game to get going. We'll see, you know, this guy has a lot of talent. I just don't want fans to forget about that. This guy was a second round pick, right? This is, this is a legitimately talented player we're talking about here. And someone, you know, that a season or two seasons ago had a ton of promise. I mean, Rams fans love this guy and the coaching staff was super high on him as well. So, you know, I don't know how this is going to really translate moving forward, but as of right now, this is great to see because at the end of the day, the Rams trust him as a starter. Doesn't really seem like he's going to be pulled from the lineup for any given reason as of yet. And if he's going to be out there, you may as well make those plays. So Daniel Jones was a guy that did not throw many interceptions this season. I don't know exactly how many he had before Sunday, maybe two or three on the season. And the Rams got him three times. So yeah, he was not great. And the Giants offense was not good. But at the end of the day, they were not mistake prone either. And the Rams really forced them into a lot of those mistakes. So huge shout out to Taylor Rapp for his performance. He was, you know, the best performer of the day, the best player on the defense, in my opinion. Great, great performance. The one guy that I thought, you know, maybe didn't play that great. And we talked about it on yesterday's podcast. I don't want to harp on it too much. Robert Rochelle, you know, this is the guy that gave up the most receptions, five targeted nine times, the most yards given up in this game, 69, just not that great. It still feels like he's sort of trying to get comfortable. It looks like, you know, there's some sort of panic in him still, which makes sense. I mean, this is a rookie starting only a second game in his career. A guy that was a fourth round pick. We're not talking about a top 10 pick here. So you know, there's still areas for him to improve, and we'll see exactly how this works out. But with Rochelle struggling, with David Long basically, you know, being pulled from the lineup, which tells us everything that we need to know about what the coaching staff thinks of him. That's why I brought up that point. Is it Dante Dion time? Is it in two weeks? Are we going to be talking about, you know, is Dante Dion the surefire starter at cornerback? Either way, I don't really know what's going to happen. It's still sort of hypothetical. We're still sort of talking out of our behinds here. We don't know what's going to happen this week against Detroit what's going to happen the week after against Houston. But in two weeks time, we might be looking at a secondary that's a little bit shaken up in terms of a good way, right? Like if you find performers that are just doing better than the guys that you initially thought were starters, you might just have to make that move. And it seems like Raheem Morris feels comfortable with doing what's best for the defense. So we'll see ultimately where this leads the Rams right now, but having an embarrassment of riches, as they say at these important positions like cornerback, that is a situation that you love to have. I mean, it is great to be able to say, you know, my fourth corner is maybe a cornerback two on some teams, maybe a cornerback three on most teams. Like that kind of depth helps you survive this season. And as we saw, you know, Darius Williams goes down. You need somebody else to step up. And about a week ago, the Rams were in a sticky situation in the sense that they benched David Long. Robert Rochelle didn't look good. Darius Williams goes down. What do you do now? Are you going to start two guys that don't look good? That's 66% of your cornerback room as starters that are not performing that well. Well, now it sort of seems like it's kind of been shaken up for the positive. So as of right now, the Rams seem to be in a pretty decent position when it comes to that secondary. We'll see you know, how these snaps look next week, the next two weeks, and really what it means for this team and what it means for this defense. Of course, the Rams have maybe not the toughest of schedules coming up here. Don't want to really talk down on any team, but I mean... Detroit, not exactly a prolific offense. The Houston Texans, kind of the same thing. So we'll see exactly how those games go. Of course, make sure to tune back in here throughout the rest of the week here at the Locked on Rams podcast, continuing to make us your first daily listen. We're going to break down that Rams and Lions game that's coming up, tell you about all the matchups to watch. Some of that backstory between Jared Goff, Sean McVay, and what it means for the Rams and the Lions. Of course, there's a lot of connections there. It's going to be fun to talk about. We're going to get into all our predictions and everything else you need to know about that contest. As always, you guys can follow us on Twitter at QB's MEP and at Locked on Rams and on YouTube at Locked on Rams. Please subscribe or follow to get our latest episodes, content, breaking news, and a whole lot more.